I'm presenting Julia Lacco. Here talking about variable fonts. Uh, Julia is a web designer, and like every web designer, has a good uh, loves typography. So he's going to introduce us to this word about variable fonts. And yesterday, uh, talking with her about this talk, uh, she tells me that he wants to be really an inspiration to get creative with this new kind of uh, fonts. So. I give the word to Julia. So, thank you. Variable fonts. The future of typography has already begun. Did you realize it? Uh, who knows some things about variable fonts? So we are going to discover something new today, it looks like. First of all, let me um, thank uh, WordCamp Milano for having me here. And you can tweet if you like to know something, uh, to, to let people outside know something about this. And start with the definition. Variable fonts, you might have seen some mm, animations like this, uh, animated GIFs around the web, and you might have started thinking that variable fonts are something that moves. Maybe, but that's not the main characteristics, in my opinion. Uh, let me make a premise before all. It's uh, about typography and terminology. In, in English, they have this nice distinction between typeface and font. Well, typeface is basically a concept, whereas in, in the digital world, a font is a, is a file. In the metal world, this is a font, more or less. Um, let's have an example. Roboto is a concept and is a typeface, whereas Roboto Italic, Roboto Bold, uh, Roboto bold italic are uh, all fonts. And then we have the typeface family. It's a nice concept to, to illustrate variable fonts because the typeface family is something that a type designer has put together under the same name, the name of the typeface. But it happens um, by history. And then we have the font family, that's a CSS property we use in our websites. We use files in websites in order for them to work. Otherwise, uh, with concepts, they won't work. <laughs> Everything we know about typefaces and fonts comes from a history, a long history, five centuries of history. And at the beginning of the um, press era, the Roman and Italic versions uh, weren't on the same family and in the same, on the same page. You have to wait a couple of centuries in order to, to have this pairing in a typeface. And even, even more, 200 two years later, to have bigger families with extended version of a font, a compressed version, and things like that. And then on, we, we start in having a big terminology in each language. You see, you might recognize in the Italian or English uh, words like uh, bold or, or grassetto, things like that. But let's go, go back to the future, the future of today. Uh, and I have a question. And the question who is, who asked for variable fonts? Well, something very unusual happened in the digital industry <laughs> um, at the end of 2016. There was an agreement, an industrial agreement between four big names on the digital <laughs> world, these four, uh, Microsoft, Apple, Adobe, and Google, and they, um, they agreed on a format. Yes, <laughs> the, the format was variable fonts. Soon, uh, some other companies 
join the crew. And what, what is the, the browser support for this? Well, one hour, uh, one year and a half later uh, after the announcement, uh, it was at around uh, 10%. One year later, it, grows to, uh, it grew to almost 80% of global usage. Uh, today we are here, 87% of global usage. I've never seen anything in, in the web uh, um, history, anything going so fast in the browser support. Maybe it's because of that agreement, I guess. So, if you are interested, I go on. What is a variable font? Well, it's not a new format. Technically, it's uh, an evolution of an already known format, the open type. Um, it's just a new version. This is the definition they gave during the announcement. It's a bit difficult to understand. I'll try to clarify a bit. A variable font, it says, is a single font file that behaves like multiple fonts. Un font che si comporta come tanti font. Che vuol dire? What does it mean? Well, every time you have something, um, a new version of something, we start, we renaming the, 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 the older version in a new way. So since we now have variable fonts, we can start uh, rename the traditional fonts as static fonts in a position. This image might explain a bit better what I mean. Static fonts are different files. Each of different files deals with a particular variation, a particular style. Uh, it's compressed or it's extended, it's bold or uh, thin, a thing like that. Whereas a variable font is just a one single font file that behaves like multiple static fonts. So maybe you understand a bit better the definition of before. Yes, no, a bit. <laughs> Well, uh, the main part of variable fonts is uh, the fact that they can take, they can take advantage of, vari of variation axes. Assi di variazione in Italian. Here we have an, a representation, a 3D representation of th on a font with three axes. Uh, representing something with the four axes is a bit more difficult but we can have a lot of different axes in a variable font. There are five registered, means predefined uh, variable axes, variation axes, uh, that, are, um, that deal with traditional typography. Let's say so, we we'll see later on better. And then you can have, sorry, a lot of custom axes. They, up, they are up to the type designer. The five registered axes are these five. Weight, width, optical size, that's a bit difficult, slant, inclinato, italic. The weight axis, it's the one that it's more useful, I guess. So uh, I'll try to explain this um, slide. From one side of the axis, we have a character with a very thin stroke. From the other side of the axis, we have a character with a very strong uh, stroke. And between the, those two, we can have a lot of variations. I just draw one, but you can have a lot of variation. How much thin and how much uh, bold the, the character will be, it's, inside, it's defined inside the variable font by numbers. 
And we have to know those, um, those numbers in order to use them in our CSS. What happens when we add an extra axis, like the width axis? We have an explosion of possibilities. These are nine, but there are a lot of in between. There's interpolation between all these shapes. I try to explain this uh, third axis that might be very difficult to, to grasp if you don't have a bit of typography um, knowledge. Well, uh, what is the main difference between the digital fonts and the metal fonts that here we have or things like that? The main difference is that in the old typography, uh, each uh, typeface, each font was optimized for a particular uh, size. So you had the proper font for each size. And they weren't only um, the same shape, shrinked or enlarged as we do, it was used, we are used to do in the digital uh, world. And with this axis, the optical size, we can bring back this characteristic to the digital world. So if we use a combination between the font size and the optical size axis, we'll end up with something like this. Fonts optimized by size. You might not notice the optimization. I try to describe it a bit. Here, we, you have a, a font with two strokes, one thin and one strong. The contrast between the two is high. You can appreciate it in a big size, whereas you cannot appreciate it here. And that's why, in that case, it's, we have lesser contrast between strokes. You, you better see this. At the, if you put them in, at the same size, you notice the difference. It's not only a question of a contrast between strokes, it might be uh, a different aperture. Yeah, the, the, smaller the, the smaller the font, the, the bigger you can dare to have the aperture. And on the other side, if you have a big font, you can dare to have a very small aperture. It's because otherwise, when it's small, I'll let you see, when it's small and you have a, oh, sorry, a small aperture, you may take that letter for a, an, a, an O, for example. The fourth axis is a slant. The slant is only something that is inclined, slanted, and it's a bit different from what we know uh, as italic. Italic is not only a, a font that is slanted, but it's something that has a different history. And in a lot of typefaces, we have different shapes for the Roman and the italic. And since the, the shapes are very different, it's not possible to have a variation between the two, an interpolation is technically not possible so this axis is just a, a Boolean axis. It's either one or zero. It's italic or not. Because of these constraints in interpolation, you have to have the same numbers of points de defining a shape in order to interpolate between the two. OK, we've seen five registered axes of the traditional typography that are now in the variable fonts. And what happens if you combine those axes? Well, you can, you can be creative. The type designer can be creative and uh, design new kind of fonts that we've never seen before. An upright italic or a slanted uh, not italic, things uh, that they can uh, think of. And this was with only five axes. 
What about with the extra custom axes? Look at this new, well, it's very new, it's freshly backed in, uh, font. And we have three, uh, whoops, sorry, here. We have three traditional axes in small cups and two custom axes. One of those is this one, it's mono axis. And this axis transform a sans serif font into a monospace font, something weird in the tradition of typography. So um, think what can happen with 60, more than 64,000 custom axes possible into the uh, variable fonts. You can start having things uh, that change uh, in, I don't know how many um, variations. And something, some, some designer might uh, think of very new kind of axes the number of points, shapes that makes an affix, uh, makes a font, or some leaves that grows out of your font, things, I think. But what happens? <laughs> Under too many possibilities, we as web designers, what can we do <laughs> with all these possibilities? Shall we become type designers ourselves? If, luckily, the format has this um, characteristic that they are called name instances. So the type designers can bring back what we had before. The type designer can choose for you the best uh, solutions and uh, put those solutions inside the font so that you can go on working as you did before, using uh, the bold, the italic, the extended version, I don't know, of the font. And not something in between. You can use something in between, but you might uh, follow those suggestions. So, what are the advantages of variable fonts? Performance, <laughs> performance, yes or no? In my opinion, you have to balance the two. So when you um, put some web fonts in a website, you generally put some different uh, styles. So you end up uh, with some of the weight of, of those styles. The, each variable font, uh, which are one single font, will Wait less, more, um, will wait less than the amount of the others, of the static ones. So it's generally a very good um, choice for performance. We're talking about performance and web fonts. Uh, you better um, use some other techniques. I don't have the time to. <laughs> to talk about this now, but you have to use uh, WAF tool, that's its compressed, compressed version. You have to make the subsetting, maybe if the license of the font uh, allows it. And you have to have a web font loading uh, practice, web practice. One of your, and today, and now it's coming, CSS is starting helping us. And another advantage is bringing back the optical size with, in, into the history of typography. You can make a fine tuning. That's, I think, uh, the real advantage of uh, you can um, put all these possibilities inside your, your website just with one file. You can, for example, think to use variable fonts to adapt to languages. 
I make an example to give you an idea. If you have a multi-language uh, site, you have a language with long words, such as German, for example, you can uh, decide to style the German version with a more compressed um, web font. Or if you have French, you are dealing with the accents, for example, you, you adjust that uh, axis. And of course, there are a big uh, advantage in the responsive web typography or fluid web typography, as you like, um, allowing for a lot of fine tuning. But there comes also some disadvantages. And the first one is the choice. Where are they? We don't have uh, so many variable fonts ready yet. On the other side, there would be uh, another disadvantage would be the price. I mean, okay, there are open source, open source uh, fonts, but there are a lot of um, fonts that you can buy. And in order to buy a variable fonts, <laughs> We, we should pay for the entire family. It is going to be, at the time being, it's quite expensive. So we see what happens in the market in the near future. Then you can have a criminal potential. That's a disadvantage. What do I mean? It's typography, typographic crimes. You have so many possibilities to use a lot of different variations that you should have an idea of what to do with that. So you might end up doing things not so nice. So use it with, um, with a project in mind. Implementation. Um, just a few words on this. You can use uh, different CSS properties. For the time being, uh, a low level font a uh, low-level CSS property is recommended if you want to use all of the axes of a variable font. Be careful that they overwrite each other so because they are low-level CSS properties. In the near future, we will use, this is uh, font variation settings, but in the near usual, we will use something that is still in the CSS for uh, font module uh, recommendation and we'll have different proper uh, CSS properties to, to deal with this. And maybe this allows the font synthesis that the browser do with that. Uh, another important thing is to um, to have a, a nice fallback stack in, when you're using web fonts. So, you might choose to have uh, variable fonts, but you still need a static one for browsers that, that don't support it. But don't do it like that. That's not the correct way to do it, the right way to do it. This is far more better, more, far more uh, progressive enhancement, enhancement uh, using the add support feature query. And at the same time, if you are hosting yourself the sites, the, the fonts, you should have the variable version and the static version as well, and do something like this. But good news are coming for those that would want to, to use this technique, and Google Fonts API version two, this is ready. And this new uh, API will allow you to um, recall both the variable and the static fonts. But where can I find the variable fonts? That was a, the question before. I've used some Google Fonts early access, but they were experiments, more or less, uh, used in, in the example as before. But here is a big new, news. Uh, there are 10 uh, variable fonts available with the new Google Fonts uh, API. And they are, if you are using one of those, you can start uh, your experiments with the variable fonts. Actually, Google has already 
uh, done this for you for the Oswald font, red, and because it is uh, really better in with with regard to performance. WordPress uh, new theme 2020 is already using a variable font. It's the Inter uh, by Rasmus Anderson. So you you might uh, take uh, the same example and find out what if it helps in the fine tuning of your websites. Otherwise, if you want to find out some other fonts, you can um, check your creative software. You might have a creative software I won't mention, but maybe you already have uh, those fonts at your disposal, some. Then uh, you can uh, look for um, font distributors or ask your trusted uh, foundry. I'll leave you some tools to play with. One is Axis Praxis, the other is uh, VFonts, Play Type Detail. In those three tools, you can um, uh, experiment with the Axis. And this is a very nice tool if you want to implement it. You'll bring, you'll drop a font and uh, it will show you like, that characteristic of the font. There are some others, tools like this. This is very uh, really nice. But let's see what we can use those variable forms for. What are the potentials? In my opinion, one of the mm, interesting potentials of that, of variable forms, are multimedia interfaces. You see what happens if you give as an input the phone movement, for example, and then you can change some weight or width axis. Okay, this is an example, it's not an interface, but you can give it a meaning in your design. Or this is, I cannot show it, let it listen to you now, but you can start, there's a link there. If you use the input as an input, the Microsoft, the, the, Microsoft, <laughs> the microphone, uh, the font will change. For example, if you talk uh, louder, the font gets bolder. For example. And, and think what it, that can be in the vocal uh, new environment we are going to. Or you can imagine to have, I don't have an example here, but some, some pressure sensor device changing with the weight for axis, for example. Or on the other side, you can have uh, fonts that adapt to the environment. There's a very nice, it's not register axis, it's called grade in typography. This is what it does. Look at the column at your left. You see, it changes just in the color of the font, but it doesn't reflow. And since it doesn't reflow, it's very useful in web design for over effect, things like that. And uh, look at this example. If you change the ambient light, the, your computer as the, the camera, as the, the input device, and this axis, the grade, can change. So if the light changes, the, the font adapts. Or you, if you have a device that can measure your distance from your screen, you can adapt the fonts uh, to the distance. Or new environments, they are mm, virtual reality or augmented reality, you have to have fonts in 3D. These are type design that announced that well, one year ago, what it was, um, when it was that they were starting um, making new fonts for those new environments. And infographics as well. I show you this pen that's wonderful for me in infographics. It, because let's take uh, big data, meteorological data of uh, each town has a temperature and the wind uh, in, 
and with the data. And then you adapt. For example, if it's hotter, the font gets uh, bolder, or there's a lot of wind, it's more slanted. So the infographic is representing big data could be easy with variable fonts. Or you can think of uh, animations, but please give some meaning, some semantic to your animation, not do it just for the sake of doing them. Or for accessibility and particular needs. Uh, I don't know, dyslexia, for example, you can adapt a lot of things in the typography in order to um, have better um, reading experiences. And as last, I would like to think of this expressiveness you can reach. There's a nice book um, I've read of Sarah Heinrich, um, with the, that deals with how the, shape, well, the shapes of the um, fonts might be linked to emotions. So uh, a, if a font that is um, very straight communicate more calm, whereas something that is um, slanted is more uh, anxious. Or, so you can have play with the temperature of your fonts. You might have a sort of uh, mood axis. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Julia. Very inspirational. Some questions? Qualcuno ha delle domande? Se avete paura, facciamo anche in italiano, non c'è problema. Domande, domande? So I'm going to ask you something. What can we do if you want to start doing something and try these variable fonts at home? I think that with the Google Fonts 10 uh, variable fonts available, you can start from, from that, for example, or play with the tools I suggested uh, and start familiarized with them. Because it's going to be something that, uh, in my opinion, will change quite fast. So get ready. Là in fondo. Avvicinati un po'. Faccio la domanda in italiano o in inglese? Do you prefer me to have the question in Italian or in English? Ok, allora, mh, volevo chiederti qualcosa in più riguardo al fatto che hai accennato della possibilità di utilizzare il font per la dislessia. Cioè che cosa intendi in particolare e come può essere utilizzato? Allora, non è un argomento semplice perché ehm, non è facile capire cosa funziona veramente o no, io poi non sono un'esperta di questa cosa. So per certo che ehm, diciamo, ci sono delle cose che si possono migliorare nella leggibilità, cioè se un font per dislessici eh, dai progetti che ho visto tendono ad avere non so, lettere tutte molto diverse una dall'altra, quelle che possono essere scambiate, la P e la B, la... Ehm, e certe caratteristiche di questo tipo possono avere magari delle, dei serif, delle grazie diverse eh, la, la P dalla Q ad esempio la B dalla D in modo che uno li riesca a riconoscere perché il dislessico di, di solito credo che mh, inverta la direzione di lettura ha difficoltà nel riconoscere eh, due cose che sono magari speculari per noi è evidente un dislessico ha più difficoltà su questo fronte oppure non so Buone regole di leggibilità, tipo appunto le aperture in un, in un testo body, hai una, le aperture un po' più, i caratteri con aperture grandi, tipo non so, l'elvetica è un bel carattere ma va usato eh, per, i, per i titoli, perché ha delle aperture molto strette. Se, lo, se le usi eh, in un testo molto piccolo, eh, le diventano chiuse, non riesci a leggerle, eh, 
ci sono proprio delle, degli elementi di fino che puoi fare, allora io immagino che un font potrebbe avere un asse legato proprio alla dislessia, dove appunto fai comparire queste diversità, eh, delle, delle grazie diverse a seconda delle lettere insomma, più incriminate e non so l'altezza di linea, proprio dei dettagli che magari studiati bene a priori aiutano questa leggibilità. Uno potrebbe avere un sito in cui mette come dire, variazione per dislessici, quindi hai miglior contrasto, o, o, potresti avere tanti tipi di ottimizzazioni, eh, quindi potresti lasciare scegliere all'utente anche come lo vuole utilizzare, immagino questo. Qualche altra domanda? Eh, non so se me lo sono perso, magari è stato detto ma non, non, non l'ho capito io. La, il motivo per cui sono nati questi font uh -huh. e poi, visto che prima parlavamo di SEO, caricare questi font dinamici alla fine non appesentirà anche il caricamento di pagine che magari non lo usano tutte queste variazioni, ma si devono caricare, penso sia una libreria più grande del singolo font che viene caricato normalmente. È proprio il contrario, ah. rispondo subito a questa domanda. Cioè, adesso... Uh, così dalle medie degli archivi delle HTTP Archive uh, sembra che la gran parte dei siti che hanno i font ne hanno 6 dagli 6 agli 8 font che caricano sono tantissimi a livello di peso soprattutto se sono implementati eh, così eh, senza una strategia di caricamento pro propria il, la, il, diciamo che se i font appartengono alla stessa famiglia tipografica allora un variable font ci consente di averli tutti 6, 9 ma io direi 999 almeno, no di più 999 sono le variazioni solo di peso prendiamo l'asse del peso eh, adesso possiamo al massimo avere 9 stati 100, 200, 300 fino a 900 no? E potremmo avere dall'1 al 999 che mi sembra sufficiente per coprire le nostre come dire, esigenze tipografiche in un unico font allora quell'unico font pesa molto meno di 4 già solo un font variabile ne pesa meno di 4 in genere per dare un'idea e quindi ehm, è conveniente allora, con lo stesso peso di prima ma anche meno ottengo un armamentario incredibile Ah, sono nato. Allora, il motivo secondo me è perché avevano tutti interesse ad avere un nuovo formato più efficiente, ognuno con le sue motivazioni secondo me, eh, Adobe li fa eh, i, i font, eh, Microsoft, Apple hanno eh, sistemi operativi, ad esempio l'Apple ha il San Francisco che è un variable font, i font di sistema, eh, credo anche Microsoft col seguo i, non lo so pronunciare UI tutti, praticamente i nuovi font di sistema dei sistemi operativi sono nati variabili eh, Adobe fa, mh, fa i programmi quindi adesso variable fonts sono disponibili io ho parlato della parte web però c'è tutto il mondo della stampa e, e dei programmi per la stampa per cui adesso hanno supporto Photoshop, Illustrator ehm, InDesign poi Sketch, eh, stanno arrivando un po' tutti ed è incredibile che si siano accordati su un, su un um, formato, cosa che avevano tentato di fare anche in passato, ma non è riuscita. Cioè, insomma, gli analisti dicono che non è riuscita per via che non c'era il web. Adesso il vantaggio è, è, è super. E poi Google, ecco, non ho menzionato, ma Google ha l'interesse a ridurre il carico di quello che distribuisce. Se pensate tutti i Google Fonts, noi prendiamo i Google Fonts, ma loro mettono i server e se loro riducono il peso, eh, insomma, risparmiano un bel po'. Quindi, per un mondo più ecologico, variable fonts. Bene. Facciamo un applauso. Volete sapere i font utilizzati nella presentazione? C'era la slide extra. Bene, allora c'è qualcun altro che vuole fare una domanda per caso? Abbiamo magari anche 5 minuti. Sì?
Ciao, ammetto di non aver ancora tanto smanettato su 2020, me ne pento. Eh, volevo chiedere, quando hai parlato di supporto alle variable fonts da parte di, del nuovo tema 2020, è a livello back-end, cioè nel senso c'è già una variable fonts di default? Sì. O addirittura ci sono anche delle proprietà a livello di, di front end, diciamo di gestione quando io creo il post, cioè posso fare degli interventi mirati sulle variable fonts? Se cambi il CSS, sì. Cioè, cioè a livello cioè, tu CSS, fai il tuo CSS. Non aggiungi... a livello di strumenti nell'editor. Non ho guardato ecco, questo aspetto. In quel, quel senso lì, no. Ecco. Direi Però che... è di default c'è cioè un variable fonts. Sì. Ah, okay. C'è cioè quello che vedete prende da un variable font, se lo vedete okay. ha una certa cura tipografica e sì, sì, effetti. Sì. Quindi... Grazie mille. Bene, allora grazie mille ancora Giulia, comunque sarà qui con noi tutto il giorno, quindi...